Welcome to this presentation in which we're going to be covering chapter 25 of our textbook. Um, and this chapter has to do with consumer law. I'm going to be honest with you starting this chapter. This is my least favorite in the um, in our textbook that we actually do cover. Um, we're going to go through several laws and kind of go through what the ins and outs of them are. It's going to feel um, I'm afraid like we're just going through a series of lists. This is an important area of the law. It's important to us uh, both in two capacities. I guess the first is that we are all consumers. We all consume stuff and um, unless we're some kind of subsistence farmer somewhere, we all buy stuff that we're going to consume. And as a result, it's important that we understand our rights, what protections exist for us under those circumstances. So in that sense, it's a very practical course for us as members of this community. Um, another way that it can be practical, and this relates more to the business law aspect of the course, is that um, as business people, uh, you will be involved in selling to consumers quite possibly, or manufacturing items that will ultimately use, be, be used by consumers, uh, very possibly. Uh, obviously, there are businesses that don't involve uh, that type of relationship with a consumer, but many do. And so it's helpful to know what your legal responsibilities are and what the mechanisms that consumers might use to enforce their rights that they may perceive that they have against you. So it does definitely have some, some uh, applicability to the business world, even though it may not be a very glamorous chapter to cover. But it's practical. And if you've ever uh, bought a product that hasn't met your expectations, or you've been disappointed in some respect, um, this can help you uh, make sure that you are getting uh, your rights honored. So let's get started. Okay, so why do we have consumer laws? Um, I guess there's a kind of some obvious reasons. I guess the first reason is consumers vote. Uh, businesses don't have the right to vote. Certainly managers who work for businesses can vote, uh, but even if they all voted with one voice, they would be, there would be a lot fewer of those folks than there are consumers because after all, we're all consumers. So even those managers uh, who uh, might want to protect their, ind their particular industries, well, that same manager is a consumer of other industries products and so he or she might not be as focused on the business side of those issues since consumers vote as you can imagine legislatures uh, listen to consumers and want to protect their interests so that's a kind of a realpolitik um, explanation as to why we have consumer laws but let's look at it maybe from a little bit more of an idealistic perspective and see why consumer laws make a lot of sense. Um, when I manufacture something, I know how it's made. I know why I connected this tab to this um, particular item. I know why the wiring is the way it is. Um, I um, have made some decisions uh, some of them have probably been designed to um, increase the utility of the item. Some of my decisions have been to make it more safe. Some items have perhaps been to make it more marketable or to make it less expensive. All of those are inherently valuable and value, uh, reasonable uh, factors to consider in, in the manufacture process. Uh, but life involves trade-offs. And so uh, when the consumer buys the item, usually the manufacturer isn't spending a lot of time talking about the trade-offs. In his ad, he's not saying, this is a great item, but we want you to know that because we, wanted, because we wanted to keep costs low, we didn't include some of these other safety features that we could have included. No, that's not the way they market. They make it sound like their item is the best and the most awesome ever um, invented. And so therefore, you as the consumer are left with questions. Or, and you may not even know what questions to ask if it's not your particular industry. Let me give you an example. Let's say I go to Walmart. I want to buy a hair dryer. When I get to Walmart, I see maybe dozens of models. But let's say I'm able to quickly uh, look and in the price range that I'm interested in, I see four models. Well, um, I can read the outside of the boxes on all four models. I can get some information about it, but honestly, the four models are very, very similar 
to each other and they're all boxed up. Well, um, let's assume for a second that I happen to have a pretty robust understanding of the manufacture of hair dryers. So I think to myself, well, I'm just going to <clears throat> narrow my choices down to two and I'm actually going to open the boxes and unscrew the casing of the hair dryer and look at how well the various um, uh, wires and, and other items have been soldered and how uh, safe I think it is because one of my greatest concerns about the hair dryer is the possibility of uh, fires or electrocutions or things along those lines and so I really want to look into the, the dryer to see how it's going to work. So I have my uh, Phillips head screwdriver out, I've opened the box um, and now I'm unscrewing. Well at this moment some helpful sales uh, salesperson from Walmart or perhaps a manager comes up and says what are you doing? And I say well I before I buy this I want to make sure that it's it's safe and so I'm going to open it up. And in fact, let's assume that I've already unscrewed it and I've looked at it and I'm not that satisfied with what I see. It's not one that I want to buy. And so I'm about to screw it back. Well, the Walmart uh, manager is probably saying, well, don't do that. We can't sell it to anybody now because maybe you've weakened one of those leads, electrical leads, or maybe you've uh, put something in there that's going to make it more flammable. We're not going to be able to sell it to anybody now that you've opened the casing. And in fact, the warranty has probably been breached as a result. We're going to have to throw this away. Don't do this again, they would probably tell me. Um, and so as a result, when I finally make my decision, I'm probably invited to leave the Walmart at that point. So let's say I go across the street to the Target. I now know better. I'm not going to open up, maybe open the boxes, but I'm not going to actually open up the casing of the hairdryer. Well, how do I know which one's the safest? How do I know how much care and attention was taken to this particular dryer? I mean, even if Consumer Report says that this particular company has the highest quality control record and this particular model is very reliable, how do I know that this particular unit of this model is going to be awesome? I mean, no manufacturing process is 100% um, uh, you know, perfect, and I might be getting the one lemon in the group. I want to open it up and see. Well, guess what? Target doesn't want me to open it up either. And in fact, the manufacturer doesn't even want me to open it up. So as a result, the manufacturer has a lot of information about the product generally that I'm not going to have and this particular unit specifically that I'm not going to have. And the reality is that most of us as consumers aren't experts in hair dryer wiring. Even if we were to open up the casing of the hair dryer, we'd probably look at it and go, hmm, I don't know what I'm seeing. This could be well designed, could be very safe, or it could be a huge fire hazard. I don't know how to evaluate this. And so you can see it's not just because we can't see inside, it's because we lack the knowledge to interpret what we see inside as well. And you know what? You might say, well, just study more about hair dryers. Well, okay, I could do that, and maybe that's a good idea. But there's too many things in our world for us to do all of those functions for everything that we buy. Buy a computer? Well, I'm going to have to spend hours and hours researching that. Buy a car? More hours and hours of work. Um, buy a cell phone? More hours and hours of work. Uh, you know, all of the things that I might buy, I'm suddenly now putting upon myself a lot of research. Maybe I'm a retired person and have the luxury of investing all the time that I, I want. Maybe I even enjoy that process. But many of us don't have as much time as we uh, would, would need to accomplish that. And or we don't think that would be an especially fun way to spend the leisure time that we have. So as a result, we aren't as informed as it's possible for us to be. And, and the, the Congress has recognized this fact and said, wait a second, the seller and the manufacturer have a lot more information, a lot more potential to have information about this product. The consumer, either because they're just an ordinary person or because they can't open the container, has a lot less information. And as a result, we ought to put the onus, the burden, on the person who has the information because he is in the best position to make the product safe and to know the product isn't safe. That's the um, more idealistic view as to why we have consumer laws.
Um, a, a manufacturer can look and say, oh, wait a second, we've had a rash of hair dryer fire cases that we've lost and had to pay huge settlements. Maybe we need to increase our uh, quality uh, uh, process, um, have more uh, checks of, of the quality of, of the work that our workers are doing, or maybe we need to redesign the product so it's inherently safer. That way, the manufacturer and the seller is in a position to, to be more informed. Similarly, Walmart might say, wait a second, we've been carrying four different companies' hair dryers. Three of the companies we rarely, if ever, have a lawsuit about, but this fourth one we've had several. Maybe we ought to discontinue stocking our shelves with that one hair dryer company that doesn't seem as reliable. Okay, so that's the idea behind consumer laws. Um, and then here's a definition of what consumers are. They are laws, obviously, to protect the consumer, the end user, the person who's purchasing it, the average Joe. The agency that does that is the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. They're charged with protecting us, you and me, from unsafe products and also from inaccurate advertising. So they really have two goals here, unsafe products, and inaccurate advertising. And both of these are terms that we need to have a little bit more uh, discussion about exactly what they mean, because they, uh, they open themselves up to more than one interpretation. I say here that you need to know the name of this agency. We'll see in this presentation that there are some statutes and some agencies that I'm not expecting you to know, and there's some that, I'm, that, I, that I am. So you may want to make a notation. This is one you need to know the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC. It's an important one in the United States. Okay, so let's imagine, we haven't even talked about the substance of what the FTC's authority is and, and, and what particular regulations it has promulgated. But let's just consider for a second that I'm a consumer and I bought something and I think that it, it has violated some FTC rule. And so I want to make a complaint about it. Well, there's a few things I can do. I mean, one thing I can do is I can go directly to the retailer where I bought it. Let's say I bought it from, from Target. Well, I can go directly to Target and lodge it a complaint. Um, or I can go to the manufacturer directly and say, hey, manufacturer, let's say it's I uh, went to ABC Company and bought their hairdryer. Hey, ABC Company, I'm not happy with the hairdryer. I certainly can go to those individuals and, and lodge a complaint. And that can be a smart strategy. I'm certainly not saying that's a bad thing to do, but that's not the FTC complaint process. I have another option, and that is, of course, to use this complaint process. I can use both, or actually three. I can go to the, the, the retailer, we'll say Amazon now. I can go to the manufacturer, the ABC Corporation, and I can go to the FTC, or I can use any combination of those. But let's look at the FTC process. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is file a complaint with the FTC. The FTC is going to investigate it. Um, they're obviously going to give an opportunity for the retailer and or the manufacturer to respond to whatever complaint that I'm making. It may find um, that there is no evidence to support that, that in fact, I did something stupid with the <laughs> hair dryer, and so the fact that it didn't work well is kind of my own fault. And so they may say, oh, no, we don't find any merit to your um, concerns. At that moment, then uh, the FTC is going to say, good luck, go about your business, we're done here. But let's assume that the FTC does find that there's some merit to the complaint, does find that the manufacturer or the advertiser or the, um, uh, the retailer has done something wrong. Well, the first thing it's going to do is try to enter into a consent order with that company. Again, we'll say the manufacturer, ABC company in this example. Okay, so now we have another vocabulary term. What is a consent order? Well, it's a statement in which the company agrees to stop whatever the disputed behavior is, but does not admit that it broke the law. So. It says, I'm gonna, we're going to stop doing X, but we're not saying X was a violation of the law. So it's kind of looking forward. It's solving the problem that they're stopping the problems that might have occurred in the future from happening. Of course, this, as you can tell by the name, it requires that the company agree to it, consent to the order. Uh, sometimes the companies will consent to these, and sometimes the company won't agree to them. 
um, you can see in this in this particular uh, situation that the consent order really doesn't help me out as a consumer. Uh, let's say that I got burned by the hair dryer. Well, a consent order doesn't um, fix the problem. They may they may be ordering the company to provide an additional a safety feature to uh, hair dryers they have they have yet to manufacture. Uh, but that doesn't make my burn go away. That doesn't uh, uh, pay my medical bill. So in that sense, it's not even if the FTC uh, finds merit, it doesn't really help me so much, except insofar as I feel good because I've helped others avoid this particular in in injury. But um, let's assume for a second that the company says, no, we don't want to enter in this consent order. We don't think that we need to do this. Um, and so under those circumstances, then it's going to go to the next part of the process. The FTC issues a formal administrative complaint. And this means we are going to go through something kind of like a trial. Um, when we're talking about administrative agencies, and you may recall in Chapter 2, we touched a little bit on administrative agencies. When we're talking about administrative agencies, typically the court, um, or the judge that hears the case, isn't a judge in the same way that we ordinarily think about state court judges or federal court judges. These are employees, not of uh, a court system, but of, of an agency. And we call them administrative law judges, more commonly referred to as ALJs. They are employees of that agency. Now they are not, uh, you might think, well, that's a conflict of interest. I mean, the FTC is issuing this complaint. They think there's something that, that wrong here. And if they work for the same agency that thinks that something has gone awry, well, it seems like the, the deck is stacked against the company. Um, well, you're, you're, you're right to identify that as a concern, but generally speaking, in, in most or probably all agencies, there's a pretty strong separation of the ALJ unit from the um, investigative unit. And so uh, within each of these agencies, the agency tries to replicate that checks and balances that we talked about in a previous chapter, where there's a legislative section and there's an executive section and there's a judicial section. So the legislative section would be the rulemaking section. That would be the section that would come up with the rules that uh, would would entail that would establish whether a breach had occurred or not, or break it, or a violation had occurred or not. And the executive branch is the part that is investigating and also prosecuting um, any company that that the uh, um, executive function has determined has violated the legislative or the rulemaking function. And then, of course, we have the um, administrative law judges. That function is acting like the like the uh, the court system. There aren't juries in, in this type of system, so we just have the administrative law judges acting like a jury would act in that circumstance. So in this situation, it's possible that the ALJ will agree with the business. I mean, that definitely can happen. If that's the case, well, the uh, FTC didn't, wasn't successful, and the um, the uh, business gets to go about its business doing it the way that it has been doing its business up until this point. So that's a win for the business. But probably at least as commonly, perhaps more commonly, the ALJ will find that there is merit to the complaint and will conclude that the company did violate the law. And now the FTC, we're not in the world of consent orders now where the business has to agree to it. Now we have a cease and desist order the company doesn't have to agree to this and in fact won't agree to this. And this orders the company to stop whatever that illegal conduct is. Um, the company might say, I, we still don't think it's illegal, but the FTC says, we don't care what you think, you need to stop it. Okay, so now the company maybe still thinks that it was in the right, what is it gonna do now? Well, it has exhausted um, the ALJ process, but there are still steps that it can take advantage of it can appeal this cease and desist order. And it has several places to go to. The first place it's gonna to go to are the commissioners on the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and um, if it's successful there, then they're done. Uh, the, the business is done, the cease and desist order is no longer in effect. Um, the next stage, if they're not successful with the commissioners would be go to was, would be to go to a U.S. appellate court. You may recall we talked about that there were 13 appellate courts. 
Well, um, obviously you don't go to every one, you just go to the one that's relevant to your particular geographical area era. Um, and of course, if the company wins here, that's awesome news for the company. Of course, the FTC does have the ability to appeal it. Um, if the company loses here, of course, the company still has the ability to appeal it, and then it would go to the U.S. Supreme Court, and obviously we have final resolution there. So let's assume, though, that the company loses all of its appeals or doesn't even bother to appeal, and it doesn't comply with the terms of the cease and desist order that the ALJ issued. Well, now we have the possibility that the FTC can seek an injunction against the company, saying, hey, you violated this order, and you're going to have to pay consequences for that order, and that would be enforceable in court. So this is just a very brief overview of how that process looks. So let's now, now that we've talked about the process, <laughs> kind of, uh, in, you may recall in, in, during an earlier lecture, we talked about um, substantive law and procedural law. Uh, the procedural law is how we enforce those rights. It answers the question, how? And that's what we've been covering here. This is the process. The process is, is fact neutral in the sense of we don't even need to know what particular complaint this consumer has. The process is going to be either exactly the same or very similar no matter what the process is. I mean, excuse me, no matter what the substantive rights are. The substance is what? What, what are the protections that consumers have? And that's what we're going to talk about now. We've talked about the process a little bit. Now we're going to talk about the substance a lot more. So let's get started. So there's going to be four categories that we're going to talk where the Federal Trade Commission can regulate. And now we're focusing upon that legislative part. Remember we talked about the three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. Now we're talking about the legislative portion, the rulemaking portion. And we're going to see what types of rules the FTC can and does make. And we'll see they relate to deceptive advertising, the regulation of sales, a credit protection, and product safety. So let's go on from here. Okay, so advertising. That might be a bit of a surprise, or at least it was to me when I started considering this topic, because after all, a, a bad ad doesn't inherently affect the integrity of the product itself. But it does make sense because if an ad says X and the product does Y, it doesn't really matter whether the product does Y really, really well. If the consumer was expecting X, then the product isn't meeting the reasonable expectations of the consumer. So when there is a disconnect between the ad and the final product, that is a, a consumer law issue. And this is an area of the law that the FTC is involved with. So of course we need to figure out, well, what is this thing called deceptive advertising? And it's exactly what you think of. It's advertising that tends to deceive the consumer, misleads the consumer, or at least could mislead the consumer. And look here, we have this word reasonable consumer. We've used, seen this word before, but let's just do a little bit of a reminder about this. Whenever we see the word reasonable in the law, we're applying an objective standard. This means that we're not looking at the quirks of an individual consumer. I mean, we all have quirks. Um, and uh, so we don't look at that person and say, well, Bob really hates avocados. When he goes to Taco Bell and Taco Bell puts in avocado stuff into his burrito, he gets really, really upset. There was nothing in the ad that said anything about avocados. And so therefore, uh, peop, uh, when Bob sues Taco Bell about it, he was acting reasonably. Well, maybe, but uh, most people like avocados and guacamole. And so the fact that Taco Bell puts that into its burritos um, doesn't seem like maybe a terrible, terrible thing to have happen to a burrito. And so we might say objectively avocados are a good thing and their inclusion in a burrito is probably a good thing for most people. I mean, Bob's entitled to his quirks, but he shouldn't be able to drive the whole burrito making industry because he doesn't like guac. 
um, most people do and if we have to live in Bob's world the guac free world it might be a less happy and wonderful place for most people so when we look at the reasonable consumer it's an objective standard what would the average person think about that particular situation not Bob with all of his quirks um, but just the that that uh, mythical person who has the average taste the average life experiences okay let's look at a particular category of things that can be kind of like deceptive advertising and this is puffing sometimes called puffery this has nothing to do with asthma or breathing problems or running too fast it's when an ad includes clear exaggerations or opinion very subjective opinions uh, here we have an example this product says that you can start looking like this and in minutes you're going to look like this I submit to you that it will not work like that and you know it too we all know that nobody can go from this to this in a few minutes if such a product existed well um, this we'd all know the name of this product and everybody would be using this product and so uh, clearly it doesn't exist and the FTC recognizes that fact and the FTC says that the reasonable consumer looks at this ad and says wait a second that's not reality that's not really gonna happen maybe I'll look a little bit better maybe if I start looking like this lady I might look a little bit less wrinkled uh, but I don't expect to look like this lady at the end of, of the application and so the the reasonable consumer standard kicks in um, many times puffery is is a, a opinion um, uh, uh, Domino's pizza is the best well best in whose opinion um, some people like thin crust some people like thick crust some people like a lot of cheese in their pizza some people don't some people like a lot of sauce in their pizza some people don't some people like a lot of toppings on their pizza some people don't um, so there is no best pizza in the world because everybody comes to the pizza decision with all this pre uh, decided preferences and so it wouldn't be deceptive advertising for Domino's to say our pizza is the best it would be an example of puffing there's somebody out there who thinks Domino's pizza is the best there's somebody out there who thinks that Pizza Hut's pizza is the best and all of the other pizzas there's somebody out there that thinks that's best um, and that's okay and it's okay when it's just opinion the idea is that a reasonable consumer can sort through and evaluate that but let's say Domino says that Domino's uses 15% more cheese on its pizza than Pizza Hut does. Well, that's not an opinion. It's either a true fact or an untrue fact. It's also not a clear exaggeration. Um, and so it's not like this situation where you know that this really isn't going to happen. And so if it ends up that Domino's only puts 5% more cheese on its pizza than Pizza Hut or actually uses the same or less, then that would be an example of deceptive advertising because it can be proven. One thing that um, the FTC uh, requires in this area is ad substantiation. When there is an allegation that a particular advertisement is deceptive, the FTC can say prove it what is the basis for this claim so if Domino's were to say our pizza is the best the FTC would be like okay whatever uh, that's not a provable fact but when Domino says our pizza has 15% more cheese than Pizza Hut's then that's something that the FTC can say prove it how did you develop that statistic and if Domino says oh, it just seemed about right well no you need to be able to have some statistical basis to substantiate that uh, maybe the amount of cheese that uh, Pizza Hut buys compared to the amount of cheese Domino's buys and also considering the various number of pizzas each a company makes whatever the basis is um, the FTC is going to require that Domino's or not not prove it but show they have a reasonable basis for it now it might end up that 
Domino's has a reasonable basis for their 15% figure, but honestly, they only use 5% more. Um, that's okay. It's okay that it, it ends up not being 100% correct if they had a reasonable basis for their statement. Because after all, Pride Pizza Hut is not giving Domino's all the data that the Pizza Hut has so the Domino's can craft its best advertisement against Pizza Hut. Okay, so let's talk about bait and switch advertising. My guess is we've all been in this position before. There's something that we want that's in scarce supply. Maybe we're shopping for a, a Christmas present that is wildly popular. Maybe it's a new a gaming system. Maybe it's a phone that's just been released that is very, very popular. Maybe it's a toy for our, young, our youngster that uh, is just flying off the shelves. And um, we, uh, we see something in the, in the paper about it and we say, ah, such and such company is carrying that model right now. I'm going to go down and pick it up. Um, well, very likely in the fine print of that ad, it says something like quantities limited while supplies last, no rain checks. Well, language like that means, well, hey, we're not saying we're going to have enough for everybody. Uh, in fact, we don't have enough for everybody. If you come here early enough, maybe you'll get one. If you don't, you won't get one. And guess what? When they're gone, they're gone. Usually, that's not going to be a problem when it is very clear in the ad that there are a limited number. And that's especially true when the retailer uh, was unable to get a higher number of the product. But let me present to you a different scenario. Let's imagine that I'm Walmart. Well, no, we'll say I'm Kroger. I'm Kroger, and um, I uh, have decided that I am going to sell gallons of milk for a penny a gallon. It's a special brand of milk. I mean, it's all safe. There's nothing weird about it, but it's a special company's milk that we're going to advertise for a penny a gallon. And so um, what I do that I'm the, the dairy buyer for this uh, Kroger, uh, I will the whole chain probably. And I say, look, we're going to ship out one of these gallons to each one of our Kroger stores. So every Kroger will have one gallon of this one cent per gallon milk. And um, all the other milk gallons that we uh, supply to our stores will be at their normal price, we'll say $2.50. So we advertise the heck out of this. I mean, all of our flyers that we send out for that week say, we've got one cent a gallon milk. And uh, it, it works. Kroger suddenly has 20% more customers that come into their store during this week. And um, obviously, the vast majority of those customers don't leave with that one cent a gallon milk. But once they're in the store, they go ahead and shop normally. I mean, after all, who wants to go to a store and then have to go to another grocery store? That's a hassle. And so once they're there, they buy some produce, they buy some $2.50 milk, they buy some meat, they buy some canned goods, uh, maybe some deodorant. Who knows the stuff they buy? Uh, but Kroger's, of course, makes profit off of that stuff. Uh, maybe the consumer is a little disappointed, but probably doesn't think a whole heck of a lot about the fact they didn't get their milk. Moves on with their life from that perspective. Well, that is a classic bait and switch situation. Um, the, the Kroger advertised a low-priced item, but that did not provide enough of that item so that the consumers that they expected would all be able to get one of those items. And now the consumer buys other items, the $2.50 milk. Let me give you another scenario. I'm a car dealership. Um, I uh, sell, uh, we'll say I sell uh, Fords. Well, the top of the line Ford um, ordinarily lists in my dealership for $50,000. But I'm going to sell it for $5,000. I only have one of these cars, though, but I don't, have, I don't share that information in my ad. I say this high-end Ford model is going to be available for $5,000. First come, first serve. Well, when I open the doors on that day, there is you know, a line of consumers who want to buy that, that Ford car. 
And the first person in line gets the opportunity to buy it. Second person in line is pretty frustrated. But I have a salesman say, you know what? We don't have that car on our lot, but we've got this other car. Look, it's, it's, it's really good too. And we're willing to sell that to you for 45000 the consumer might say, well, I do need a car, and yeah, this has what I need, and they might go ahead and buy it. Some will leave in a huff, but some might buy it. And obviously, the Ford dealership doesn't need everybody who's arrived for this deal to buy. I mean, if they are able to persuade just a few of those people to actually buy a car, it was a pretty good deal for the um, a dealership. So you can see how bait and switch advertising works for the um, retailer. You bait with the inexpensive item that you only have a few of, and then you persuade the consumer to switch. And that applies to the car dealership, and it applies to the grocery store. But you can see how that's not really fair for the consumer. The consumer has gone to that store with a certain set of expectations, and they've been disappointed. And this was oftentimes a calculated decision on the part of the advertiser. So this can be a bait and switch situation. And um, that would be a violation of the FTC regulations. And that could result in a complaint being filed. Um, there's an example that is discussed in the textbook, Ross v. Fleet Bank. And in that situation, um, a credit card was offered to a consumer. And it had very favorable terms for the consumer. Once the consumer signed up, though, the favorable terms were promptly ended and less favorable terms were rolled out. Well, the consumer said, this is bait and switch. I signed up for one thing, thinking it was going to continue as it had been described, and the uh, service provider switched. Well, the court said in that situation, yes, that can be a bait and switch scenario. I have more information about this case in the folder for this particular module. Okay, so let's say that there has been some deceptive advertising. Sometimes it's going to be limited to a particular product. And certainly the FTC then can restrict the um, action against that particular uh, manufacturer or retailer to that particular item. But many times it has to do with a class of items, not just one model, but many models. There's been some false advertising regarding Going back to my uh, Domino's pizza ad where Domino said it's using 15% more cheese than Pizza Hut. Well, that would probably apply to all kinds of pizzas that Domino sells, unless the ad was very specific and said our pepperoni pizza um, has 15% more. And so the FTC has the power to issue a multiple product order that applies not just to the one order that maybe the consumer was complaining about, but to a whole class of products. The FTC, if it finds that there's been deceptive advertising, can order corrective advertising. And you can imagine how thrilled that a, 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 a business would be at this sense. You know, advertising is expensive under the best of terms, but for corrective advertising, the business has to advertise, spend its money to tell the consumers that it was it deceived them. So the this new ad does several things. Number one, it costs money. Number two, it undermines the faith that the consumer has in that business. And number three, it actively acts to discourage the consumer from using that product because now the consumer knows the true information about the product. So you can imagine not a very good uh, position for that company to be in, but in extreme cases that can be ordered. And of course, this is motivation for companies not to engage in deceptive advertising. So here's an example. It's hard to find a lot of deceptive adver advertising that was really, really clear, uh, but you can see here we have this baby consuming a 7-Up not recommended for babies, uh, for babies to consume. So if, if, a, if I mean, this is a very old ad, obviously, but if, if a 7-Up were to run an ad right now, then obviously corrective advertising would be required because this suggests that it's healthful, beneficial to babies to consume 7-Up. Um, I don't think babies would even like 7-Up, to be honest with you, but it's been a while since I've been a baby, so I could be wrong about that. Okay. 
Uh, let's talk about telemarketing and electronic advertisements. Um, these are also regulated by the FTC. You've probably gotten calls on your cell phone or perhaps your landline from automatic phone dialing systems. It's when you pick up and there's that delay before you hear a voice, or maybe you've heard a pre-recorded message. Now, such uh, pre-recorded messages or automatic dialing are not prohibited under all circumstances, but they are prohibited in the solicitation situation. So if you have an ongoing re uh, relationship with the business, they can use those tools. But when they are cold calling you, when you don't already have a relationship, they are not permitted to use those tools. That doesn't mean that the companies will play by those rules. So don't be uh, surprised or chagrined when you actually get those calls. Uh, they are prohibited, but they still do happen. In addition, you can't, uh, or companies can't send facsimiles to your facsimile machine unless you've agreed to it. Of course, the idea here is that if you, um, uh, you know, agree uh, to haven't agreed to it, then your facsimile machine may be tied up and unable to receive other faxes. And of course, it's eating up your ink and your paper. So it's costing you money, and naturally, you don't want to get ads that, that aren't um, things that you want under those circumstances. Okay, so what do companies who are involved in this business of advertising via telephone have to, to do in order to comply with the law? Well, here are some rules, and we have five that we want to talk about here. One is that they have to let the consumer know this is a sales call. They can't pretend it's something else. Doesn't mean they won't, but that's what the rule requires. They have to identify the product name and who is selling the product and they have to tell the total cost of goods being sold. That would include taxes, shipping, and handling, and things like that. Um, and then they also have to tell the, the listener if it's a telephone call or the reader if it's, say, an, a facsimile or an, a, an email, whether the sale is non-refundable. And if the consumer requests, they have to remove that consumer's name from the list. Now, um, this is what the law requires, but this doesn't mean that all businesses comply. In fact, I would say this is an area of the law where compliance is not especially high. And so just because you tell them you want to be off the list doesn't mean you're necessarily going to go off the list. There's another set of rules, and that is when the FTC can call consumers. Uh, and the, the time is from 8 a.m. until 9 p.m if they call outside of that area or if they use abusive language or profanity or they continue to call after they've been told that they that the consumer doesn't want the call that would count as abusive behavior okay so um, another way to protect oneself against these types of ads is to put your telephone numbers on the do not call registry um, when the do not call registry was initially set up, it was really in a world where most people use their landlines for most of their telephone calls. And as a result, your cell phone was pretty safe from getting many calls. For one thing, uh, cell phones uh, did not have unlimited plans back then, and so people really only used it to talk to people whom they wanted to talk to because it was costing them money. Um, but nowadays, uh, we see more and more solicitation via cell phone and so it's becomes more and more uh, practical and sensible for people to actually put their cell numbers on the do not call registry so i'm going to actually end the presentation here for just a second and take you to the do not call registry so you go to www.donotcall.gov, G-O-V. And here you'll see um, some range or some options. You'll click on register your phone. And if you register before, you're going to verify. If you're sure you haven't registered, you're going to hit register here. And then you're going to enter the telephone numbers to your email and confirm it. You'll hit submit. So really, you just have to put your number in, put your email, do your confirm email, hit submit. 
you'll get an email uh, from uh, to that email address confirming that you are interested in in putting this number on the registry you click a button you're done it won't take you more than two minutes it's super super quick super super easy um, and so uh, I encourage you to do that if you don't like to get solicitations now it would be lovely if this were to solve the problem forever and ever and ever but um, it probably won't um, you will find that there are companies who don't follow or they're supposed to but they don't you'll also find that there will be entities that don't have to follow this do not call registry for example your bank doesn't have to follow because you already have a relationship with your bank um, you uh, charities don't have to follow polling companies don't have to follow it so there will still be activity still calls that you will receive that perhaps you don't want to receive but it should re reduce those numbers okay so uh, something to consider if you have an interest in that. Tobacco regulation. Um, the Currently, the tobacco industry is prohibited from advertising on radio and television. And this applies to both traditional and smokeless um, uh, tobacco products. Um, so that's why you don't see those types of um, ads um, on radio and television. Once upon a time, they were permitted but the idea was that in many cases they made tobacco seem tobacco use uh, glamorous or appealing and that might have encouraged people who otherwise would not have used tobacco products to use the tobacco products and so that's uh, the reason why they were they're prohibited from advertising this area you may recall we talked about First Amendment rights when we were talking about the Constitution and we talked about how commercial speech is a is is protected under the first amendment right to freedom of speech and businesses can ex, uh, use that commercial speech but commercial speech isn't as broadly protected as political speech and so the the courts have allowed the government to regulate commercial speech and the government has to show that the regulation is reasonable and that the government is uh, protecting a reasonable interest and certainly in this case the government has a pretty easy job of doing that because tobacco has been proven scientifically to be an unhealthful and dangerous product okay so now we're going to talk about <coughs> packaging information we've all seen things like this um, on the uh, products particularly food products that we buy um, that describe the various nutritional aspects and they will also list the various ingredients um, the goal of the, the packaging is of course to provide accurate information that is in a format that's going to allow the consumer to understand it and make meaningful choices as a result and so you can see how um, we get information such as the number of calories in this product the size of the product so if I happen to eat you know three cups of this I, I can see oh wait a second um, you know I what would that be that would be um, four ish um, uh, serving sizes so I probably have consumed close to a thousand calories um, and then I can also evaluate how much fat I've had or how much cholesterol maybe I'm worried about my sodium intake and so these can can help guide me into whether this is a good product for me to buy and if it is how much of this product I ought to consume of course if the product is potentially harmful then the consumer I'm assuming the manufacturer also has to tell me that too um, let's say I'm taking a over-the-counter medication but if I ingest too much maybe it will I will have some bad side effects associated with it and so it's going to let me know about that type of information as well the law also defines food that we might see in our ads for example it defines the term fresh and low fat there are other terms though that aren't defined sometimes it's because that they are hard to define so this is because it's a political hot um, political hotball that that nobody kind of wants to or various people want it to mean different things and so terms like GMO or um, things like that um, haven't been defined because um, of political um, 
and administrative reasons. So don't assume that because a product advertises that it has a particular characteristic, that that necessarily means that the government has vetted it or has defined those terms. It may mean something that this particular manufacturer may have put a very different meaning on it, that it may have little or no meaning if it's a term that hasn't been defined um, by, the, by the government. And of course, the fact that a product says it's low fat doesn't necessarily mean that it's healthful or that it's fresh. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's healthful. I mean, donuts can be fresh. That doesn't make them healthful. Um, many things that are low fat, for example, um, rock candy, uh, hard candy would be probably low fat, but it wouldn't necessarily be helpful. healthful. So um, don't read into these terms more than what they literally mean. So we've talked about deceptive advertising. Let's go on and talk about the regulation of a variety of sales. <coughs> and here we have a list of five categories of sales that the FTC regulates. Door-to-door -door sales, telephone and mail order sales, used car sales, funeral home sales, and real estate financing. These are areas that are regulated and they all kind of share a similar idea. These are all people who are kind of at a vulnerable point in their lives. Um, when somebody knocks on my door, I didn't invite them to knock on my door. They are some sense invading my sanctuary. And this person who has come to knock on my door is uh, stepping into kind of my zone uh, where I wasn't necessarily expecting that. Um, when I am purchasing funeral services, many times it's because of a uh, loss, loss that I'm going through. Maybe I'm grieving uh, for the death of somebody and I have a relatively short amount of time to make decisions about um, choices. And, and I may feel a pressure to uh, buy a certain type of service uh, because um, I want uh, somebody to think that I cared about this person or, or something along those lines. Um, in the case of real estate financing, and used cars, the, the issue isn't so much that somebody's approaching me at a vulnerable point, but it's more that the seller has a lot more information than, I, than the buyer does. The used car, I haven't, uh, I'm not an auto mechanic. I don't know all the ins and outs of what's inside the car, so I'm not in the best position to be able to say whether this car is going to be a lemon, going to be a jalopy, or is it gonna be uh, well-functioning. Similarly, real estate financing, that's a pretty sophisticated subject. Most of us don't have um, the savvy to necessarily make a lot of sense out of it. With telephone and mail order sales, again, the, consu the consumer has less information. He or she can't touch the product, can't um, sometimes not even read the packaging, although sites like Amazon are, are better at giving you that information. And so again, the consumer is, is at a, a shortfall in terms of information compared to the retailer or the manufacturer. So we're gonna go through each one of these categories and talk about the particular protections that the FTC gives to consumers in these cases. Okay, so somebody knocks on my door, they want me to buy something. Um, I might be inclined to agree to buy it simply to get them to go away, or I might be afraid that if I don't buy, they're gonna come back and uh, vandalize my home or something along those lines. And so uh, the, the concern that consumers have in that situation is that um, dangerous salesperson or that persistent salesperson. And one way that the FTC responds to that is by having a three-day cooling off period. I, the consumer, can change my mind within three days and undo that sale. The salesperson is required to let me know both verbally and in writing that I can change my mind and that notification has to be in the same language that the salesperson has been speaking to me in. So let's imagine for a second that um, this community where the salesman is going up and down the streets, the prominent language is Vietnamese and the salesman has been using Vietnamese as he goes to each house. But when he tells the, that Vietnamese speaking consumer about the product, he uses Vietnamese, the Vietnamese language. But when he explains to them about the, this three day cooling off period, he switches to Russian or Japanese or 
Hungarian or whatever the language is. Well, yes, he's actually said the words, but because the consumer probably doesn't speak those languages, the consumer doesn't know about it. Well, it needs to be in the same language. Um, so it, so the, in, under those circumstances, the salesman has not satisfied his obligations under the statute. Okay, let's talk about um, mail order and telephone sales. Um, uh, the sellers are required to ship the items within the time promised. If a time hasn't been specified, the default is 30 days. Now, if you've dealt very much with Amazon, you may be thinking, gosh, 30 days is a lifetime with respect to Amazon. I expect my item within a day and send them on the same day, right? Um, but, uh, of course, this, these laws are somewhat antiquated back in the day when you actually would call up or even mail your order to the uh, mail order place. You may have had the experience, at least that I have had, where I have uh, 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 ordered things from Amazon and I have been told well I will get this within seven days or within 12 days or whatever and it always seems like it comes sooner than that um, I uh, maybe I've just been insanely lucky but I, I'm guessing that's not what's going on there because Amazon is required to provide the items within the time period promised it has an incentive to give a kind of a pessimistic time range. Um, so maybe Amazon looks, or it's computer, obviously not a human being, but the computer looks at the system and goes, we think we can get it to Groover's house in five days. But you know what, there could be bad weather. Uh, the mailman might be not so good in, in Groover's neighborhood. So we're gonna tell her seven days. And that gives us two buffer days. I mean, there's still gonna be times where we're beyond the seven days, but it won't be very often. And so as a result, most of the time I'm going to get it in four or five days and I'm going to think to myself, wow, Amazon's really efficient. They told me seven days. And that's another reason Amazon may want to overstate how long it's going to take because um, that last experience that the consumer is having with Amazon when the good actually arrives is a positive one. And so that may make um, the consumer feel like, ah, Amazon is even more efficient than they thought they were. Um, let's say that you get an unsolicited gift from a mail order place. Well, then you can treat that as a gift and you are not required to return it. You're not required to pay for it. Um, so let's say that I am, uh, I want uh, to buy War and Peace. Um, through Amazon. I go to the website, I order War and Peace, and they actually send me um, uh, Little House in the Prairie. I don't want Little House in the Prairie. I contact Amazon and say, you sent me Little House in the Prairie. I don't want Little House in the Prairie. I want War and Peace. Amazon will say, consider Little House in the Prairie a gift from us to you, and we will send you um, War and Peace as soon as we can. Um, <clears throat> because that's not what the law provides. Amazon may not tell you it's what the law provides. They may want to make it sound like it's them being good at customer service, but um, that's that's why they do it. Also, because they want to be good at customer service too, I'm sure. Okay, so used car sales. This is a bit of a mixed bag in terms of where we look to enforcement. We certainly have the role of the Federal Trade Commission, but we also have state statutes. As you can tell by the name, Federal Trade Commission, that's concerned about federal law, national law. But the fact that we have state laws in this area tells us that there's additional protections that we may have under state law. So an example of protections that we have as consumers under federal law is protection against odometer fraud. And this is when the um, uh, uh, car dealership rolls back the odometer. So let's say this particular car should have 120,000 miles on it. That's how many miles it has actually traveled. That's what the uh, consumer who sold it to the used car dealership uh, showed on the odometer when it was sold. But the used car dealership looks at the car and goes, you know, it looks pretty good for 120,000 miles. I think we can persuade someone that it only has 70,000 miles on it. 
So they roll back the odometer 50,000 miles. Well, guess what? They can charge significantly more money for a car that has 50,000 50, fewer miles on it because that suggests that it's going to uh, be reliable for a longer period of time. Well, that is a type of fraud. It is a crime, and it is also a violation of the uh, regulations that the FTC enforces. But that, of course, is not the only protection we have. Um, states also have what are called lemon laws that protect people from this, this type of behavior. And so I have on the next slide just an introduction to the lemon law, the statement that we have in Texas. And again, it's designed to protect um, us, us consumers from businesses that sell used cars. Now, lemon laws usually don't apply when one consumer is selling a car to another consumer. So you have to be, be careful about that circumstance. You have fewer protections as a consumer than if you were to buy it from a, a retailer. Of course, you may end up paying more if you go to the retailer too. Let's talk about funeral home sales. So we talked before people are in especially uh, uh, vulnerable position many times under these circumstances. And so it makes sense to, uh, to protect folks in this vulnerable time. Typically they're grieving, they may be in shock, and they have to make very significant, large financial decisions in a very brief period of time. Um, one of the things that the rules require is that the funeral homes have to give consumers itemized lists. They can't bundle everything up and say, you know, if this is a, you know, I loved my husband package. <laughs> um, and that has, you know, the Cadillac version of the, the funeral. And then the next package is, I liked my husband package. <laughs> Um, which has fewer goodies. And then finally, I didn't care a lot for my husband package. You can imagine kind of what the message is about which package um, most of the grieving widows would purchase under those circumstances. Instead, the funeral homes have to give the itemized um, price information. So the, if the widow would like or widower would like to buy um, the, the top of the line casket, he or she doesn't have to buy the top of the line flowers that go along with that item. Also, funeral homes can't lie about what the law requires. Um, for example, is embalming required in this particular state? Uh, funeral homes have to be honest with the uh, 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 family about whether it's required or not. Let's talk about real estate financing. This is, again, another complicated area where there's a lot of uh, factors that go into uh, this. And as a result, um, the lender is required to provide the buyer with an estimate of what those, uh, those closing costs will be. And this allows the buyer to compare. So the closing costs with, re with the lender A are this, the closing costs with lender B are this. And um, they, A and B may be offering different interest rates, but if the closing costs are sufficiently different, it may make sense to even consider accepting a higher interest rate when the closing costs are smaller. So that estimate helps the buyer make an informed decision about what product he or she ought to buy. Online sales, uh, obviously, very similar to the, the mail order stuff we talked about before, um, have opportunities for fraud. And so certainly if there are irregularities with the sale, there can be wire fraud, which is a, fe a felony, a, a, a federal law felony. The FTC absolutely has an ability to regulate this industry. And as more products come out and more services are offered through online uh, mechanisms will likely to continue to see growing uh, regulation in this area. And it probably makes sense to have this area be regulated on the federal level because obviously Amazon and all the other companies in this area typically don't restrict themselves to a particular state. Um, they sell to people in all 50 states and oftentimes internationally as well. So we've talked about deceptive advertising and the regulation of sales. Now let's talk about uh, credit protection. Um, and this, the, our main law here is TILA, which is the Truth in Lending Act. You do need to know the name of this statute. 
One important factor of the statute is this applies only to consumer laws, loans, I'm sorry. Um, and again, as this chapter is about consumer laws, right? So it makes sense that we're focusing on consumer loans. When business situations, when a business is getting uh, money, the idea here, the expectation is that the business probably has accountants or uh, other people who are um, uh, uh, more sophisticated about the, the that this process and have more tools available to them. So uh, there isn't the requirement that certain things be disclosed as it would be with consumers. Okay, the first thing is that the documents have to be written so that consumers can understand it. That they're written not at the level of, of so a bunch of attorneys can understand it, but that or ordinary people, maybe even people that don't have any college experience, would be able to read it and understand uh, what the terms are going to be. Also, Tyler requires that there be certain protections when a credit card is used um, not by the person who has authorized the use of the credit card. For example, a credit card number has been stolen or something along those lines. Well, obviously, if it's been stolen, the person who has stolen it, or at least stolen the data, is intending to use it. Otherwise, why would you, you steal it? So um, there's a cap to the level of, of, ex of exposure that that consumer has. And typically, the exposure cannot exceed $50 per card. So if the thief immediately uh, buys you know, $1,000 worth of stuff, uh, that consumer only is going to be responsible for the first $50. If the consumer is Johnny on the spot and immediately senses or knows that um, the, uh, the credit card has been stolen and reports it to the credit card company so the credit card company can suspend the card um, and then the, uh, uh, for some or another the, the suspension doesn't work and after the suspension uh, the thief does successfully use the card, well that $50 limit doesn't even apply that that consumer is not going to be charged any amount of money. So when you are confident that your credit card has been compromised, calling sooner rather than later may save you some money. In addition, Tyler prohibits creditors from denying credit based upon these statuses. statuses. One is race, religion, national origin, color, sex, marital status, or age. I think most of these are probably pretty clear and it makes sense that we wouldn't want discrimination on the basis. I want to talk for just a second about marital status because this is one that may not be as immediately intuitive to you, but it's, it's an important one historically. Once upon a time in law, and this isn't even that long ago, um, even I think as recently as the 60s, um, the property rights of married women were um, reduced upon her marriage. Um, single women had the same type of, of uh, rights to order their financial life as, as a single men and married men, but married women had fewer rights. And the idea here was that um, married women needed fewer rights because they had a husband to quote unquote take care of them. And the idea being that all the money went into a single bucket. So if you have two people who can exercise control over that bucket, they might have conflicting intentions with that money and there could be problems with it. That was the idea, of course, even saying it, it sounds silly and, and sexist and all other kinds of other things. Um, and so that is not the law nowadays. Um, back in the 70s, if a woman were to become a widow or were to divorce after a marriage, she might find it very difficult to establish credit, to get a credit card in her own name, even though she had had a credit card with her husband for many years and they had paid conscientiously on the credit card. And the idea was that credit companies said, well, that's really not the lady's, the wife's, um, it's not to her credit, it's to the husband, because after all, the husband was the one earning the money, the husband was the one paying the bills, she was along for the ride. Well, um, that in many cases wasn't the case, but in any event, they were an economic unit, and so the good decisions they made as a couple should also be um, to the benefit of the wife once the marriage ends, just like the husband or the widower 
or the ex-husband gets to benefit from the good economic decisions that he made while he was married. So marital status is not a, a function. Being single, being married, being divorced, being widowed cannot affect or should not affect your eligibility for credit. Let's talk about credit reports. <laughs> this is a really complex area. We could have a whole course just on this topic, but I'm just going to touch on a few high points. And again, this is a stat status statute that you need to know. Many times this is called FICRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And of course, it's about, as you can see in the name, credit reports. Well, what is a credit report? Well, it's a document that contains information about all of your financial transactions, how promptly you pay on your credit card, um, all the stuff that gives a picture about whether you're making good financial decisions. And it's reduced to a FICA score. This says your credit worthiness. Um, and obviously, the higher the score, the more likely you are to get credit and the more likely you are to get credit at a lower interest rate. So it's a good thing to do things that will increase your, your score. Um, there's lots of factors in it, even people, um, it's not all about how promptly you pay, although that's certainly a big factor, how, how much credit you have available, uh, how much credit you have open, things like that also affect your, your score. Um, this credit report obviously can be used by lenders to decide whether to extend you more credit, but it be, can be used for other purposes too. Um, it can be used by employers, it can be used by licensing agencies to decide whether it's appropriate for you to receive a certain license. Um, sometimes items in credit reports are not accurate. Um, when I was in high school, this happened to my dad. My dad's um, uh, he, he didn't have a common name, well, he's still alive, so he doesn't have a common name, but there was somebody who had his same name who lived in our same zip code. It was kind of a small world thing. Anyway, unfortunately for my father, this gentleman uh, uh, had made some bad finance, or was, had found himself in some bad financial predicaments. And so what happened was that, um, this uh, the, the records of this man and my father's were kind of mingled up. And so my father's credit uh, worthiness was compromised because of this other man's uh, financial difficulties. Um, and so uh, my father didn't know about it for quite a while and then something happened. I can't even remember what it was. Maybe he wanted to refinance his, his house or something and, and this, this popped up on the credit report and he was asked about it. He's like, oh, no, I, I didn't do whatever it was. And so he then had to go to the credit reporting agency and say, hey, clean this up. You had this wrong information about me. And um, under those circumstances, the, the uh, a credit reporting agency investigates it and if it finds that there is an error we'll remove that record going forward. Um, generally speaking information that is over um, five, seven years old cannot be reported except for bankruptcies and bankruptcies can be reported up to 10 years. So if there is an opportunity to clean up your record. Um, if you've ha had some dings, they will eventually fall off. Um, and of course, even in the interim, making good choices will lessen the impact of maybe some of those unfortunate events that happened in your uh, earlier career. Um, if a, a credit bureau issues a credit report for a reason that uh, FICRA does not permit, then there can be consequences for that. And there's a lot of very specific rules about when credit reports can be issued and when they can't and what they can contain and what they can't contain. So let's say you apply for a credit card and you are denied. Um, well, then you get to um, request at no charge to yourself a copy of the credit report. The idea here is that you may have a situation similar to my dad's where your credit has been mixed up with somebody else's. So this gives you an opportunity to contact that agency and get that credit report fixed, at least going forward. Um, and then, oh, let's talk about the, um, the, the Chase Manhattan situation. 
This is also, there's some information in our module about this particular case as well. In this case, somebody got a notice in the mail, I guess it's probably Mr. or Ms. Kennedy here, saying that they had been pre-approved for a credit card. And wow, good news, he decides, we'll say it's a he, he decided to go ahead and complete that process. And um, then he gets a notice from the bank, I'm guessing it's Chase Manhattan, which is now of course Chase, and said, oh, well, yeah, uh, we don't really want to give you a credit card after all. We are unpre-approving you for the credit card. And uh, Mr. Mc Mr. Kennedy goes, well, wait a second. You told me I was pre-approved. I qualified. Uh, you can't change your mind. And Chase says, well, yeah, we can. I mean, at that point that we approved you, we hadn't seen your credit report because we couldn't because of the rules. We just had some general information about you and you look like you were going to be a good risk, but we, we decided after looking a little bit more closely that we were unimpressed. And so uh, the question was, do, can Chase back out of it? Well, the Federal Trade Commission said initially, no. I mean, you said this person was pre-qualified. That's basically a deceptive ad right there, right? Well, Chase won this one. He said that, no, uh, this means that there still can be take backs, I guess. And so this isn't a, an ironclad commitment that the bank is making that it will, in fact, extend credit. Here, uh, so let's talk about the debt collection process. There are two categories of debt collectors. So, um, um, there's a category of debt collectors who are collecting debts on behalf of others. So this would be a situation wherein um, I hire somebody to collect debt for me. That is what we ordinarily think of as a debt collector. Another category of circumstances would be when I am trying to collect my own debts. Um, I have a retail store and somebody has not paid for it. And so I call them up saying, hey, you need to pay. Well, I'm still being a debt collector. But the laws that I'm about to talk about don't apply in that situation. They only apply to the professional debt collectors. So let's talk about what the professional debt collectors cannot do. This is a little bit similar, unfortunately, to the telephone solicitations we get. Because the debt collecting industry doesn't have the best reputation in the world and sometimes debt collectors don't follow all the rules. So don't be surprised if you see or you've heard about circumstances where these rules weren't followed. It doesn't necessarily mean that the rules don't apply. It just means that sometimes people don't play by the rules. Again, it could be a situation in which the rules don't apply because the a business owner is actually doing his own debt collection. But let's just look at these for a second. One is you can't contact the debt debtor at work if the debtor's employer objects. So you can connect, contact them at work up until this particular time. When I was at JCPenney working in the legal department, this was a pretty common thing that we would have employees in stores who um, had somehow or another uh, gotten on the wrong side of a debt collector and they would call the switchboard at JCPenney and uh, want to, to talk to the, the sales employee. Um, well, this would tie up the switchboard and it would make that employee less uh, productive um, as they were supposed to be doing other tasks. Um, plus, uh, as you can imagine, if you're running the cash register and you get a call from a debt collector, that's not necessarily going to make the best customer experience for the customer that you're ringing the sale of. So for a lot of reasons, JCPenney obviously did not want these calls. And so I would then, as the attorney would call the, the debt collector and say, don't call again. And usually the calls would stop because of this particular requirement. And the fact that an attorney was involved kind of made them... Uh, even a little bit more conscientious. So that's a, a, a good thing to keep in mind. If one of your employees in this situation, um, contact the debt collector and the calls should stop because they can be very intrusive. At times, there would be debt collectors who would call, you know, every 10 minutes and they'd really be harassing. Okay, another thing that um, the debt collectors can't do is they can't contact a debtor who has notified the collection agency that he wants no contact with the agency. Um, so that's another piece of advice that the debtor um, can be informed of. Just tell them you don't want to hear from them. Doesn't necessarily mean they'll comply with that, but they're supposed to comply with that. And you can see that the debt collection agencies can't call out of those same time frames that we talked about with the telephone solicitation. 
Can't call before 8 a.m., can't call after 9 p.m. And this is the time zone in which the debtor is located. You also can't contact, the, the debt collector can't contact third parties about debt. Um, so, but you can contact the debtor's parents, the spouse, or financial advisor. So you can't contact the employers. Hey, do you know your, your employee's a deadbeat? Or you know your ex-husband or ex-wife's a deadbeat? Or you know your, your uh, grandchild's a deadbeat? No, you can't do that. You, have, you can only call these particular parties. And you can't use obscene or threatening language. But just to be clear, threatening language would not include threats that are lawful threats. For example, we're going to sue you unless you pay. Well, I mean, you can sue people. So an example of threatening language would be, we're going to break your kneecaps. That would be a threatening language. Threatening to take legally uh, permitted actions is not a threat. And finally, debt collection agencies can't misrepresent themselves as lawyers or police officers if they, in fact, are not. So we've talked about um, deceptive advertising, regulation of sales, and credit protection. Now we're going to talk about product safety. And you may be thinking, this is what I thought we were mainly going to talk about. Well, we've saved the best for last then, if that was what you were expecting. We're going to talk about um, the F Food and Drug Administration now. You do need to know the name of this agency, but you don't need to know the name of this law. So I'm not even going to say the name of the law. But we're talking about the FDA, which is what the Food and Drug Administration stands for. So what do they, um, uh, what are they responsible for? Well, you probably guessed it, food <laughs> and drugs. Um, you probably would have even assumed medical devices. But the one item you might not have thought about was cosmetics. And they are... Uh, their role is to make sure that they are safe, that, you know, that, so they inspect, say, slaughterhouses to make sure that uh, there isn't uh, unsafe practices with the meat or um, that, they're, that the drugs have the right protocols in effect so that they don't become contaminated and that they are, their formulations are generally safe and things like that. Obviously, the FDA has those three branches that we talked about before. They're going to have a legislative branch, which is the rulemaking function. They're going to have an executive branch, which is the enforcement or the investigative function. And they will have a judicial branch, which is where the ALJs will be hanging out, and they will be making final determinations. Um, so they definitely are involved in rulemaking or regulations. Interesting note is the FDA cannot regulate tobacco. We previously talked about tobacco for the purposes of advertising, and the Federal Trade Commission does have the authority to prohibit those types of, of ads, but the FDA does not have the ability to regulate tobacco. And I guess the idea here is that it's not a food, it's not a drug, it's not a cosmetic, it's not a medical device. Common sense also kicks in here. Obviously, tobacco is a controversial product. Uh, there are lots of people who use it commonly and there's a fairly large industry in the United States uh, that uh, makes money as a result of it. Tobacco farmers, tobacco manufacturers, uh, various entities that sell, sell tobacco products and so there's a lot of uh, politics involved in this and uh, related to that is the idea that really tobacco, is, at least as far as we know to date, can't be manufactured in a way that is generally you know safe. It has things in it that are going to be bad for you, even if filters are put on or even if other aspects make it a little bit more safe. It's still a dangerous product. So at this point, this regulation remains in effect. Okay, so um, the um, Federal Trade Commission issues mandatory standards regarding product safety and also is involved in helping volunteer uh, agencies, or excuse me, um, industries, sorry about that, uh, protect, uh, develop a voluntary product standards. The FTC is involved in recalls, and of course recalls can be voluntary, where the industry itself says, or a particular company says, we're going to recall the products, but sometimes they can be mandatory, and the FTC comes in and says, uh-uh, this is not good. Again, you don't need to know the name of this statute. Uh, the um, FTC also does research and advertises consumers about product safety. Um, 
many times these will be public service announcements. Uh, other things that are uh, subject to regulation are highly flammable products, clothing. Um, obviously that's a, a, a hazard. And then also uh, toys that children have access to to make sure that they are safe. For example, you've probably seen a million times on uh, various items that um, uh, items that uh, have a choking hazard children under the age of, there'll be a warning of, about children under the age of three. And the idea is that until a child is three, he or she is very prone to put things in his or her mouth and could swallow and choke or be injured by the product. And so uh, toys for very young children have to be sufficiently large in all their parts so the child won't choke on that particular item. So we've covered all of the categories of protection, deceptive advertising, regulation of sales, credit protection, and product safety. So we initially start out talking about the procedures and we've talked now about the substance of the rules. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, send me an email, come to my office hours, or raise those in class. I thank you for your attention. And I hope this information has been helpful for you. Have a great day.